Good evening and welcome. Tonight I have for you some history magazine articles. And all of them are biographies of famous explorers or scientists. These articles were picked by my channel members. The first one I have for you is about Juan Sebastian Elcano. This was chosen by all the happy squirrels. Then I have for you the Herschel siblings. This one was picked by Laura Taylor. And then I have for you, you can kind of see over here, it is about Salomon Auguste Andre. And this one was picked by Jacob Lowe. If you would like to pick a history magazine article and get a shout out in a video, you can click the big join button right down there. Or if you're on mobile and it isn't visible, you can click the first link down there in the description box to join. It's only 99 US cents per month, the lowest I can possibly send it, and you get all kinds of different perks. But let's get into it. Let's read about Juan Sebastián Elcano. I'm kind of banking on the fact that maybe you haven't heard of some of these people. They're kind of the lesser known heroes of history. So let's learn. If you have no idea who this guy is, let's find out. Mooring at the southern Spanish port of San Lucar de Barameda on September 6, 1522, the Victoria's hull was so rotten that it could only stay afloat by continually operating the pumps. Three years before, the ship had set out from port as part of a proud five-ship flotilla under the command of Captain General Ferdinand Magellan. Since then, of the four other ships, three were lost and one had deserted. Of the 250 men that had formed the flotilla's original crew, only 18 returned that September day. The man who had captained the survivors on their long journey home, however, was not Magellan, killed in the Philippines more than a year before, but a Basque seaman named Juan Sebastián Elcano. By steering the frail Victoria across the Indian Ocean and around Africa's Cape of Good Hope back to Spain, Elcano completed the first known circumnavigation of the world, a total journey of 45,000 miles marked by hunger, scurvy, murder, and mutiny. Elcano did not suffer from a lack of fame in his country on his return. Europe's most powerful man, Charles V, the King of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor, duly praised and rewarded the captain who had so heroically completed the voyage. Nevertheless, outside Spain, Elcano's name has been much less known. His feat is often popularly attributed to Magellan, and many believe eclipsed by Francis Drake's circumnavigation of the globe nearly 60 years later. Born to Sail Juan Sebastián Elcano was born in the port of Guitaria in the Basque country on Spain's northern Atlantic coast around 1476. Based on the limited sources on his life, historians know he was one of eight siblings in a family that was wealthy enough for him to have an elementary education. Young men in Guitaria and along the Basque coast had the sea in their blood. Many fished and whaled, reaching as far as the cod-rich waters off Newfoundland. It's likely that Elcano undertook such work, because he gained enough experience and acquired enough money to buy a twenty-ton ship twice as large as the Victoria. Information on Elcano's dealings is scant. Historians can infer that something went awry because Elcano was forced to sell the ship. Records show that he sold it to Italians, which was against the law. 
Years later, when Elcano became a national hero, King Charles pardoned him for his past crime. It is thanks to that pardon that historians know anything at all about Elcano's fleeting early days as a shipowner. Going around the world. It was probably as a direct result of having lost his ship that Elcano enlisted in 1519 as second in command on the Concepcion. This ship was one of the five readying for a long and hazardous voyage under the command of the Portuguese-born Magellan. The mission's objective was not the circumnavigation of the globe, but a daring trade coup against Magellan's native Portugal. Spain and its neighbor were economic rivals at the time, both laying claims to the Americas and their resources. Portugal controlled the eastern trade routes to the Indian Ocean and the Moluccas, or Spice Islands, which is today part of Indonesia. Magellan's plan was to find Spain a westward route, westward route, oh, that's hard to say. westward route to the Spice Islands. The five-ship flotilla set out from Seville on August 10, 1519. Sailing west to South America, Magellan sought a waterway that would connect the Atlantic to the other great ocean sighted by Vasco Núñez de Balboa from Panama six years before. Frustration soon beset the expedition. Failing at first to find sea passage, Magellan was forced to sail very far south along the continent's coast. Tensions between the Portuguese Magellan and the Spaniards in the crew led to a mutiny in the Patagonian port of San Julian. Two, and perhaps as many as four, of the other ships' captains mutinied against Magellan, and so Elcano, as the... hold on, look at that map as the Concepcion's second officer took part. Magellan gained the upper hand, executed two of the mutinous captains, and marooned another leader of the rebellious crew. He refrained from executing Elcano, and instead stripped him of his post. Elcano was forced to maintain a low profile, but this demotion would later be responsible for saving his life. Heavy losses. In November 1520, having lost two ships, Magellan and his diminished crew became the first Europeans to enter the Pacific from the Atlantic after sailing around the tip of South America. Following a grueling crossing of the Pacific, they reached the Philippines, where, in April 1521, Magellan was killed in a skirmish by the people of Mactan. Days later, the king of Cebu, who was considered an ally by the Spanish, invited the surviving captains of the expedition to a meal. They were killed while they ate. Elcano, thanks to his lowly post-mutiny status, was not invited to the banquet, which saved his life. After the slaughter, only about a hundred crew were left. The survivors burned the Concepcion leaving them with just two ships, the Trinidad and Victoria. The two vessels pressed on. In September 1521, Gonzalo Gomez de Espinosa was elected as Captain General and Captain of the Trinidad, and Elcano as his deputy in charge of the Victoria. The ships finally reached the Molucca Islands in November. In the weeks that followed, Elcano and his commander dedicated themselves to formalizing treaties with kings of the nearby islands and preparing their boats for the long journey home. Entitled to 20% of the cargo, the sailors had a clear incentive to fill the hold with valuable clothes, selling their capes, shoes, and even their shirts to make room. While the two ships were being loaded and readied for the long voyage home, the Trinidad sprang a serious leak. It was agreed the two ships would separate. The Victoria would head west toward Africa, while the Trinidad, following repair, would strike east to Panama. The 
Trinidad struggled, turned back to the Spice Islands, and was eventually destroyed. Then there was one. On December 21st, 1521, the victorious anchor was finally raised. Under Elcano's command, she headed southwest through the Malay Archipelago with 60 men on board, 13 of them indigenous islanders from the Moluccas. By February, Elcano had entered the Indian Ocean to embark on one of the greatest nautical feats in history. It was the first time a European had crossed this enormous body of water at its widest expanse. For months, without making landfall, the crew was forced to ride out furious gales, always under threat of Portuguese capture. There were many deaths. After rounding the Cape of Good Hope, the crew nearly starved to death, forcing Elcano to stop in the Cape Verde Islands. Several crew members were taken hostage by Portuguese forces there. Fearing the loss of his precious spice lead and cargo, Elcano rapidly put out to sea. The bedraggled and much reduced crew finally spotted the coast of southern Spain in fall 1522. Granted an audience with the Spanish king, Elcano was ennobled and presented with a shield on which a globe bore the Latin legend Primus Circumdedesti Me. You were the first to encircle me. Despite this achievement, Elcano left historians very few documents of his own. The account of the voyage, in a letter written to King Charles on his return, and the answers he gave to a questionnaire presented to him by an imperial official. The only substantial chronicle of the great voyage was written by Antonio Pigafetta, one of the eighteen original crew members who returned with Elcano. Pigafetta's account, however, contains no reference to Elcano at all. The father of two illegitimate children who both died young, Elcano never married, and the born sailor would not opt to stay long ashore. In 1525, he took part in another expedition to the Moluccas, and a year later, without having reached the Spice Islands again, Elcano died of scurvy, the disease that would carry off so many in that age of longer voyages. In a simple ceremony, with his shroud weighed down by cannonballs, his body was buried at sea in the Pacific. So let's see these pictures here. We have a map of Southern Asia from 1522. That's pretty neat. You can see India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Malaysia. It's interesting. And over here, this is where Magellan was killed in the Philippines. This is what I really want to look at. This cool map here, you can see he sailed over to Mactan, where disaster occurred. He messed around there, probably being a little lost till we made it to the Moluccas. Over here by Timor. And he's going to sail across the widest expanse of the Indian Ocean, because normally if people were sailing this part, not necessarily Europeans, but Africans, Kins, Asians, etc., they would obviously follow the coast here, keep it safe and simple, but he set out this way, for whatever reason, through the ocean, by the time they reached here, they were pretty wrecked. They sailed up here, they stopped at Cape Verde, which was Portuguese controlled, probably a bad idea, but they were desperate, right? They sailed up, and wait, was that Spain? a stamp with him on it, and a big statue of him here in Seville. Oh no, it's not Seville, it's in um, Qataria, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, but it's in Spain. Let's move on to our next biography. Someone, or two people you probably have not heard of. The Herschel siblings, who swept the heavens. Brother and sister, William and Caroline Herschel, 
left their promising musical careers to become astronomers. Whatever history lost musically, it more than gained scientifically. Until the Herschels, stargazing had largely been limited to observing the sun, moon, and planets visible to the naked eye. With improved telescopes of William's design, the siblings made the first systematic observations of the stars and nebulae beyond the solar system, setting the course for the modern scientific discipline of astronomy. Their chosen profession was a long way from the humble life of the Herschel family in Hanover, Germany. Their father, Isaac, played oboe in the city's military band, a few steps up from his own father's position as a gardener. He insisted on a musical education for his ten children as a means for social advancement. William, twelve years old, twelve years older than his sister, I should probably finish reading, twelve years older than his sister, learned to play the oboe, violin, and organ, and followed his father into music. But as the Seven Years' War with France closed in on Hanover, William fled to London, arriving in 1758 at the age of 20. He found work as a music copyist, then tutored and performed until he landed a spot as church organist in Bath in 1766. Located around 100 miles west of London, Fast-growing Bath had a lively intellectual scene at the time. William placed himself in the thick of it. He joined the Bath Philosophical Society, and through lectures, discussions, and readings, soaked up the latest findings in science and physics. He studied the relationship between acoustics and mathematics. These interests led to physics, then to optics, which introduced him to astronomy. However, his, however great his love for music, it was no match for astronomy and his self-proclaimed mission to learn the construction of the heavens. A giant discovery. By the early 1770s, William was studying telescope design. To manage his dual commitments to music and astronomy, William invited his 22-year-old sister, Caroline, to join him in Bath after the death of their father. She had been living a cloistered life in Hanover, looking after their mother, and eagerly accepted the offer, arriving in England in 1772. Also an accomplished musician, she played the harpsichord and sang. While continuing her musical studies and looking after the household, she worked by her brother's side. Caroline grew equally captivated by the night sky and absorbed her brother's knowledge of astronomy. A working arrangement developed between the two. William made observations while Caroline did the exacting work of cataloging and calculating the locations, an important step toward the modern mathematical approach to astronomy. The following year, frustrated by the performance of his telescopes, William set out to make one of his own design. Making a telescope was a team effort, as many of the components came from different sources. Eyepieces, micrometers, tubes, and other parts required skilled craftsmen. The metal mirrors needed intense polishing, since large glass mirrors were not available at the time. Caroline recalled William's commitment to the task in her memoirs. My time was so much taken up with copying music and practicing, besides attendance on my brother when polishing, that by way of keeping him alive I was even obliged to feed him by putting the vitals by bits into his mouth," she wrote. This was once the case, when at the finishing of a seven-foot mirror he had not left his hands from it for sixteen hours together. By the end of 1779, having verified his designs, William was considered the foremost telescope manufacturer of his time. Two years later, while studying double stars, which is two stars that appear close together when viewed from Earth, 
William noted a faint object that moved slowly against background stars over several nights. At first he thought it was a comet, but with further study and confirmation from colleagues, it became clear he had found a planet, one of the solar system's ice giants. At first he called it Georgium Sidus, Latin for George's star, in honor of King George III. Naming the new planet for the British monarch raised hackles in some other countries, so William opted for Uranus, the sky god from Greek mythology. Jupiter, Saturn, and the solar system's inner planets had been recognized for millennia since they are visible to the naked eye. Uranus was the first planet discovered using a telescope. For his discovery, William won international fame. He was knighted and made court astronomer by the king, with an annual pension of 200 pounds, on the condition he live near Windsor and be available whenever the king wanted to stargaze. Sweeping the Skies William and Caroline abandoned their musical careers in Bath and moved near Windsor Castle to take up the life of full-time astronomers. In 1783, they began their path-breaking 20-year survey of the night sky, called sweeping, which is when you look through the eyepiece of a telescope and sweep from horizon to zenith, to find deep sky objects like nebulae and star clusters. It was painstaking work. William could not divert his gaze, while Caroline spent hours recording her brother's observations and confirming measurements and angles. During this time, Caroline was conducting her own sky sweeps and making discoveries. Identified in February 1783, her first find was an open cluster, NGC 2360, nicknamed Caroline's Cluster, the constellation Canis Major. That summer, she found NGC 205, a satellite galaxy to the Andromeda Galaxy. Caroline's Rose, NGC 7789, an open cluster in Cassiopeia, followed later that year. In August 1786, she made history as the first woman to discover a comet. In her letter to the Royal Society describing the discovery, Caroline wrote, in consequence of the friendship which I know to exist between you and my brother, I venture to trouble you in his absence with the following imperfect account of a comet. Despite the self-deprecatory tone, recognition soon followed. The following year, the king recognized Caroline's key role by awarding her a stipend of 50 pounds a year, chalking up another first for her, and arguably her most significant she became the first woman to draw a salary as an astronomer. Along with her important scientific advancements, Caroline's uniqueness was in her ability to get that work recognized, according to Herschel scholar Emily Winterburn. William's public acknowledgement of Caroline's work helped his sister gain acceptance from the scientific community but Caroline also knew how to win the approval of her male peers by combining scientific rigor with charm and social skill. This balancing act was an impressive achievement, Winterburn writes, and delicately done. In 1787, William's telescopes revealed moons of Uranus and new moons of Saturn two years later. William's 1788 marriage caused some tension between the siblings, but they continued to work together on their sky sweeps. William and Caroline surveyed almost the entire sky visible from southern England, compiling a list of 2,500 new sky objects, including nebulae, star clusters, and galaxies. Their discoveries were published in the Catalog of Nebulae and Clusters of Stars, which would become the foundation for the New General Catalog of Nebulae and Clusters of Stars, or NGC, its use today. Caroline continued to work with her brother until his death in 1822, after which she returned to Germany. 
She revised Williams' three catalogs of nebulae and star clusters, for which she received a gold medal from the Astronomical Society in 1828, a first for a woman. Caroline died in 1848, and her epitaph reads, The eyes of her who is glorified here below turned to the starry heavens. So here we can see some diagrams and observations made by Caroline. Look at this huge telescope. This is designed by the Herschel, it says. It cost 4,000 pounds at the time, which is probably way more today. There's some notes here about discovering Uranus. Reflecting telescope made by William Herschel, and there they are, hard at work. He's polishing the light, and, he, and she's there ready to give him some tea. Alright, let's read our final article of the night. Let me just move these so we have this out of the way. Here we go. We have North Pole by Balloon, the Andre Expedition. Now, if you haven't heard of anyone in this, I'd be least surprised if you haven't heard of this guy, because it's a very not well-known story. So let's get into Hundreds of people tried to reach the North Pole in the 19th century, all by ship or sledge. All failed. Dozens perished. But only three tried to reach the so-called Arctic Grail by balloon. They were led by Swedish engineer Salomon August André, who told a London audience at the 6th International Geographical Congress in 1895 that a hydrogen balloon could succeed where other methods had not. Andre's critics heaped scorn on what the London magazine Punch called his balloonatic notions. There was no way to control speed and direction, they said. Failure was inevitable. Undaunted, Andre would take off from Sweden with two fellow explorers two years later to try to reach the pole, only to disappear. Decades would pass before the world knew of their fate. The Balloon Bug Born in 1854 in the Swedish town of Grana, André grew up to be a mechanical engineer with a keen interest in aviation. In 1876, at age 22, he was wowed at the Philadelphia World's Fair by aeronautic and balloon displays, seeding his lifelong fascination with balloon flight. André was born into a period of Arctic exploration. High-profile attempts to reach the North Pole were all the rage, yet none had been successful. In 1871, American explorer Charles Francis Hall had tried and failed to reach the North Pole aboard the ship Polaris. Undeterred by Hall's failure, British naval officer George Nares set out for the Pole in 1875, and likewise did not make it. Nares' venture convinced many there was no way to sail to the North Pole. Having caught the ballooning bug in Philadelphia, André threw himself into flight, making several crossings of the Baltic Sea. These experiences paved the way to the conference speech he gave in London in 1895, when he made his much-criticized proposal that the pole could be reached by balloon. André, however, had answers for every objection. His balloon would be a hundred feet tall and made of doubly, double-ply silk, varnished on both sides to prevent gas leakage, thus ensuring they could stay aloft for many days. His wickerwork car carried bunks for a crew of three men, three sledges, two light boats, tents, and significant provisions. He attached sails to steer and drag ropes to control altitude. His study of wind shad convinced him that a steady northerly wind would take them over the North Pole to Alaska in a matter of days. Taking flight. Although still regarded as reckless by many, Andre's plan impressed Sweden's King Oscar II. Alfred Nobel, the wealthy inventor of dynamite, provided the funding, eager for his country to make a mark in Arctic exploration. Andre's scheme attracted global attention. 
the press would be updated via buoys and carrier pigeons. On July 11, 1897, following many frustrating delays, Andre and his crew, Neil Strindberg, an assistant professor of physics and photographer, and Knut Frankel, a civil engineer, lifted off from Danes Island, Spitsbergen, in their balloon, dubbed the Urnen, or Eagle. After briefly soaring above the crowd, something went wrong. Either a sudden cold current of air, or the effect of the hanging drag ropes, caused the craft to be forced downward so sharply that the car struck the water. Onlookers screamed as Andre released ballast. The balloon climbed and was visible for about an hour, calmly soaring away to the northeast. It was the last time the three men were ever seen alive. Among the mysteries of the fates of several North Pole explorers, that of Andre and his balloon expedition may be the greatest, said P.J. Capilotti, professor of anthropology at Penn State University and author of The Greatest Show in the Arctic. He used a novel, daring, and, as many thought, foolhardy technology, all but guaranteed to appeal to the imagination. Over a week after the launch, one of Andre's carrier pigeons was intercepted with a message. Written on July 13th, it stated, 82 degrees north latitude, good journey eastwards, 10 degrees south, all goes well on board, this is third pigeon post. No other messages, however, were found. Where is Andre, is the question being asked, the civilized world over, declared the Galveston Daily News on August 6th. Years would pass before two buoys were found, both dropped on the day of the launch. One read, We are now in over the ice, which is much broken up in all directions. Weather magnificent, in best of humors. Expeditions were sent to find the three men, but no trace of them or the balloon was found. The mission was lost. Unexpected Recovery more than three decades later, the mystery would be solved. In August 1930, a team of Norwegian scientists were studying glaciers aboard a seal hunting vessel. They took advantage of the unusually warm summer to land on White Island. Exploring the island, they were surprised to find the remains of a boat sticking out of the ice. In it was a hook with the words Andres Polar Expedition 1896 stamped on it. More than three decades had passed, but the fate of the Andre expedition was finally known. After further exploration, the remains of Andre, Strindberg, and Frankel were recovered, as were their diaries, logbooks, camera, and film. The three men's bodies were transported back to the Swedish capital, Stockholm, where they were cremated and buried. The diaries and photographs clarified much of what had befallen the crew after takeoff in July 1897. The Urnen had remained airborne for nearly three days as it drifted northeast. Andre's sense of wonder is apparent from his journal entries. It is not a little strange to be floating here. Oh, is it not a little strange to be floating here above the polar sea? To be the first that have floated here in a balloon? We think we can well face death having done what we have done. Isn't it all, perhaps, the expression of an extremely strong sense of individuality which cannot bear the thought of living and dying like a man in the ranks, forgotten by coming generations? While the entry was being written, the mission was already running into trouble. Shifting winds pushed the craft westward from July 12th. Hydrogen gas was leaking from the balloon, which was hovering at low altitude. Fog caused a layer of thick ice to form on the balloon's surface, weighing it down. To stay afloat, they threw out ballast and some equipment, but to no avail. For long stretches, the balloon bounced along the ground, about every 50 meters. On July 12th, the team decided to jump ship and abandon the mission, 300 miles away from the pole. Photographs developed from Strindberg's frozen film reveal the remains of the crashed balloon and the camp the men set up near the crash site. 
Just over a week after the crash, the team decided to try to reach Franz Josef Land, an archipelago in Russia, where they had stashed emergency supplies. After they moved equipment across drifting ice for days, the ice started to drift west. This is not encouraging, Andre wrote. The three continued trying to move toward safety, but by mid-September, with dropping temperatures, they had no choice but to hunker down. They built a shelter from ice blocks and hunted seals and polar bears. In early October, shifting ice forced them to White Island. On October 8th, as bad weather closed in, Andre made his last entry. The causes of the men's deaths are still unknown. Experts believe the trio had enough supplies to have survived the winter, but were struck by illness. Researchers at Sweden's Karlinska Institute, together with Andre's historian, Andre historian Bea Usma, are applying the latest technology to decipher Andre's last diary, much of which is illegible. We are finding clues that look promising, but there's still work to be done, Usma said. Here's a very haunting photograph, then, isn't it, at a camp here. How incredible is that? Here you can see that their diaries were wrapped up inside this shirt to preserve them as much as possible. Here you can see their route that they flew here, their Spitsbergen and so up, but then starts to drift west, starts to drift east, northeast, and that's where they crashed on the ice, and this is where they traveled along the ice here, and they landed up at White Island. How interesting. I wonder, because I have my book open to the Arctic, can we find it? Because there's Svalbard right here, and White Island. Let me see. It should be somewhere around here, I guess. But anyway. Very sad story, isn't it? He was so hopeful. And then we can see the balloon being inflated here. A chilling photograph here with the balloon all crashed in the ice of the Arctic. And here's the guy himself. And that's going to be it for tonight. I hope that you enjoyed these articles. Let me know if you learned anything cool, if you've never heard of these people before and you thought it was interesting, I want to know. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a good, good, good